Flooding is a natural process of river and coastal systems. It occurs when water levels exceed a river's carrying capacity and the water overtops the river's banks, or when land is flooded with seawater. Over the last 80 years, the UK has seen 12 major flood events, and seven of these have occurred since 2000. With climate change scientists predicting wetter winters for the UK, it is likely to mean more flooding. We also see continuing development taking place in flood-prone areas across the UK, which might mean that more people are living or working in areas at risk from flooding in future. Though flooding is a natural phenomenon that can be beneficial for ecosystems, it becomes extremely detrimental when it affects property, infrastructure and agricultural land. This means that social and political action is needed to reduce the impact of flooding and address society's vulnerability to flood events. But what is vulnerability? A good definition of vulnerability is the social and economic factors that determine someone's ability to cope with stress or change. When thought about in terms of environmental issues, often it is related to physical factors that influence the vulnerability of an area to flooding. But there are key social and economic factors that increase vulnerability to flood events. These include a person's health and their well-being before the flood event, prior experience of flooding, wider community links and availability of support networks such as family, friends and neighbours, and a person's age or gender. In terms of economic factors, financial capital and income, financial help from the government, and having household insurance all contribute to vulnerability. An example of the social, economic and political dynamics of flooding is the winter floods of 2013 to 2014 that affected several parts of the UK, one of which was Somerset, a low-lying area in the southwest of England. The majority of this area is below sea level, making the land vulnerable to both tidal and river flooding. In the winter of 2013 to 14, Somerset experienced extremely high rainfall, resulting in severe and prolonged flooding, particularly within the Parrot and Tone River catchment. Approximately 290 homes were flooded, and it took over 12 months to repair some of these houses. Agricultural land was also flooded for prolonged periods, and farmers struggled to find safe places to house their livestock. People also experienced difficulty in travelling because major roads were underwater and some villages were completely cut off. The impact of the flooding in Somerset was both social and economic. In economic terms, for example, farmers' crops were lost or damaged, livestock had to be moved where possible or destroyed, people struggled to get to work and important infrastructure such as train lines and roads were severely damaged meaning many insurance claims were filed for home and business repairs. In terms of social impacts, it is emotionally distressing to lose precious possessions that have been ruined by flood water, or to be evacuated from your home for an extended period and lose the support of nearby friends and neighbours. These can combine to produce a feeling of powerlessness and be extremely traumatic for the people affected. Given the impacts of flooding on people's lives, there is a need to adapt to the potential risks of inundation by flood water. One method of doing this is using resistance measures, physical changes that prevent flood waters from entering buildings or minimize the damage from flood waters. Examples of these measures range from large infrastructural projects like flood walls and barriers to smaller scale measures such as floodgates air brick covers, a waterproof covering for brickwork to prevent water coming in, or flood pumps to remove water before it floods the building. Resilience is about the ability to maintain functions necessary to live your life during a flood event, or to be able to recover quickly without long-term impacts. People, communities, infrastructures and places can all be resilient, 
There is also an overlap between resilience and resistance. Some forms of resilience are physical, such as home modifications. For example, special flooring that can tolerate flooding, is resistant to water damage, and also contributes to the building's resilience by enabling a quick return to normal after a flood event. But resilience also includes emotional resilience, being prepared to deal with flood events and having support networks so you can get help if needed. For example, in Somerset, many people were evacuated from their homes as floodwater left some houses too damaged to be inhabited. As a consequence, evacuated residents were unable to stay connected to their communities or access the support of friends, family and neighbours. In order to maintain access to these support networks, evacuated residents had to create mechanisms like keep in touch groups, which allowed them to stay in contact with friends and neighbours. One resident involved in the keep in touch groups had this to say. You are separated from all your possessions, therefore your normal life is on hold totally. For some people it was a very emotional experience at the time. We were involved a lot with a keep in touch group, help setting it up, organising it, contacting people and giving support. In the UK, it is projected that 5.2 million homes are at risk from flooding. That's one in five of the houses in the UK. Looking to the future, we need to think about how the UK's flood risk is changing, and how social and economic factors have as much of a role to play as physical changes to the environment. This will be important if we are to understand how we can combat flooding through both resistance and resilience.